Hey everyone, welcome to the Grace and Truth broadcast. I'm Dwayne Sheriff, and I'm sharing on the message of God's amazing grace. And if you haven't been able to be with us, we have archived these television broadcasts on my website, and you can watch one through five if you'll simply go to pastordwayne.com, pastordwayne, D-U-A-N-E.com, then you can catch up and listen to the first five broadcasts so that I believe it'll help you with number six. So let's talk about grace in the sense of humility, of humility. Humility is the pathway of God's amazing grace. When we learn to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, we actually position ourselves to receive more of God's grace. It is pride, pride in our lives or pride in our hearts that hinder the grace of God in our lives. And so we need to look at some of these things because again, the pathway of, of grace is humility. That is the highway of God's grace in our life and increasing in grace. Pride is actually a six lane highway to a devil's hell. And we don't wanna have anything to do with that highway. And many times in our lives and in our hearts, God will reveal some type of pride in our lives. And we need to deal with that pride quickly. We gotta get off of that highway of, of pride as quick as possible because that's a highway of death. It's a highway of destruction in all of our hearts and in all of our lives. So let's talk about humility now and look at some powerful scriptures in regards to humbling ourselves because there's more grace for you, brothers and sisters. If you can humble yourself, there's grace to be the parents we need to be in this hour. There's grace to be an employee and one of the best employees in our, our businesses or an employer uh, and be the best employer possible. Grace, we've seen, is God's power in our human weakness. Grace is what makes us who we are and empowers us to do the will of God for our lives. So we could use some more of it. I don't know about you, but I could use more grace in my ministry, more grace in my home, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we grow in grace? How do we get more grace? Well, James dealt with this and the apostle Peter dealt with it. So let's look at what James said first in James chapter four. And this chapter opens up with some profound questions. And these were things that puzzled me when I first got into ministry. And James is dealing with, why is there all this strife among even Christians? Why do we war and, and, and have all this discord and disunity? And he begins to explain how that that's our flesh. And that even in seeking God and asking God for things, we're not praying right. We, we ask, but we don't receive because we ask amiss because we want to spend up whatever our answers are on selfish pleasures. And so we have to learn our motives in prayer and seeking God and receiving from God. And then he makes a profound statement in James chapter 4, verse 4. He says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That is so important in our personal relationship with the Lord. And that we understand that when we embrace the ways of the world, when we, when we allow the world to conform us into their, into their image, when we want to be friends with the world, we actually position ourselves as enemies of God. Well, brothers and sisters, I don't want to be an enemy of God. I want to be a friend to God. And therefore, in my friendship, my loyalty, my love and commitment to Jesus, that positions me many times in this world and I become an enemy of the world. I'm not saying I go out of my way to offend anybody or to, to cross anybody. But man, if you're going to live for Jesus, if you're going to live godly in this present evil world, you will, you shall suffer 
persecution or rejection. If they hated Jesus, they will hate us. If they rejected him, there'll be many that will reject us. And so we have to learn to deal with that rejection. We have to learn to deal to and train our hearts to be loyal to Jesus. Again, he said, when we're a friend of the world, it's like having an affair on the Lord. Boy, that is different. And a lot of people just do not see their relationship with the Lord in that way. We are married to Jesus, the scriptures teach. We're his body, flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones, the very body of Christ in the, in the earth. Our spirit, man, is absolutely united one with the Lord. 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, so we have this intimacy with the Lord. We have this relationship with the Lord where he's like a husband and we're like a wife in a marriage, in a marriage type relation. And so when I befriend the world, it's like committing an affair on the Lord. He called us adulterers and adulteresses. He's not talking about a natural affair or natural adultery. He's talking about where do your loyalties lie? Where are your commitments and, and, and your relationship as it relates to Jesus versus the world. And so that's pretty serious stuff. And I want to be a friend of God. I know you wouldn't be watching if you didn't want to be a friend of God. Well, when you're a friend of the world, you make yourself and position yourself as an enemy of God. And none of us want to do that. Listen at this scripture right here, verse 5. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, jealously. God has a godly jealousy over you, brothers and sisters. He loves you with a passionate, committed love. And there is a godly jealousy that the Lord has for us. The scriptures teach in the Old Testament that God's name literally is jealous. Wow, that's pretty profound, that his very name is jealous and that he yearns for your relationship. He learns for intimacy with you. He, he yearns, brothers and sisters, for you to come to him for all your needs in your life, for you to come to him as the supply of everything you need in this life, for you to come to him as the source of your identity, the source of your prosperity, the source of, of your joy and your peace. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you is drawing you into relationship with the Lord and fellowship with the Lord to intimacy with the Lord. That is powerful. Then all of a sudden in verse 6 he says, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Think about that for a minute. God resists the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. Verse 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. I don't believe he's saying there that we're still, even though we're Christians, sinners by nature, no, if you're born again, you have a righteous nature now. You have a new nature in Christ, a new man. You've become a new man in Christ, and you're the righteousness of God now. You're still saved by grace, and you have a flesh and an unrenewed mind that you have to deal with that will gravitate toward the world still and that Satan can tempt you through but you're not a sinner saved by grace. You're not a sinner by nature any longer. That old man that was dead in sins and trespasses was crucified with Christ, buried, and now you've been raised anew. With that said, with that said, James is saying, hey, you need to learn to submit to God, resist the devil. You need to learn to submit to God first, then resist the devil. A lot of people are trying to resist the devil, but they're not submitted to God. You cannot resist the devil in human ability. You cannot overcome Satan in your flesh, after your flesh. You can only overcome sin by God's amazing grace and only overcome Satan and his temptations by the grace of God. So then he begins to give you attributes or signs and symbols of what grace looks like, of what humility looks like. 
Humility is submission to God. And in humility, we submit to God first. Then we resist the devil and the Bible promises he will flee. Then he says, listen carefully, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. That's not legalism. That's not God saying, you do this and I'll do that. No, God is a humble God. Jesus is a humble God and rules, at least in this age, by grace and mercy and is humble. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus talked about his yoke and taking his yoke upon us and learning of him because he was meek and lowly in heart. Jesus is humble. God is humble. He doesn't force salvation on anybody. He won't make you get saved. If you're watching me right now and you've not made a commitment to Christ, God will not force you to go to heaven. He will not force you to love him. He will not force you to come to him. He'll draw you. He'll convict you of sin. But you have to humble yourself and you have to receive salvation by faith. And that happens in humility. Well, the same thing's true after we're born again. God's not going to impose healing on you. He's not going to impose impose the gift of the Holy Spirit on anybody. He's not going to impose prosperity on you. No, you have to buy, by by grace through faith, draw nigh to God. Seek God. Yield to God. Submit to God. That's humility. And when you do that, God draws nigh to you now in more grace. Boy, that is powerful. I hope you can receive that today. I hope you have enough humility and that you can humble yourself to submit to God. Submit to His Word. Submit to His character. Submit to His kingdom and his plans and ways for your life. Because when you submit to God, that's being humble and more grace comes to you. And that more grace is what empowers you now to be all God's called you to be, the light of the world and the salt of the earth, and to do whatever God's called you to do, to be a witness in this world, to be a blessing to your children and a blessing to your friends and your coworkers a blessing to your family, a blessing to your community. That's what grace does. That's what humility does. Humility brings more grace, and now we become a blessing to everyone everywhere we go. And that's God's plan for your life. When he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, he's talking about how that sin in our lives defiles our outer man. Sin doesn't defile your spirit. Your spirit is sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That's a part of the basics of, of grace is that you're born again and your born again spirit is righteous and truly holy and it's sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. And when or if I sin, it doesn't defile my spirit. I don't have to get born again, again, every time I make a mistake or I sin or I fall. No, sin defiles my body and my conscience. And the reason that I'm repenting is not to get God to love me or get to go to heaven now and miss a devil's hell. All that is forever settled in my commitment to Jesus as Lord. But when or if I sin, when or if I yield to Satan's temptations, my flesh gets defiled and my conscience gets defiled. Boy, there's a, a teaching I have on this and you just need to go to my website that just talk, talks about our righteousness and our holiness in Christ and how that our spirit man is sealed and that it's our outer man that gets defiled by sin and I'm repenting to apply the blood now to my conscience and to my outer man. So James is saying, look, you need to cleanse your hands, you sinners, meaning if you're sinning, you need to repent. One of the attributes of humility one of the signs and symbols where you can know if you're a humble person or not is if you're repentive. Are you able to change your mind? Are you able to admit I'm wrong about something as God enlightens me and turn from it? Pride and a staple of pride is unrepentant, unrepentant. This is what sends people to a devil's hell. Jesus on the cross has died for the sins of the whole world. He has made salvation available for everyone. He has made an atonement for the sins of the whole world. It's not technically people's sins that sends them to a devil, devil's hell. It's their unbelief. 
It's their rejection of Jesus. It's their unwillingness in their pride to repent. Boy, that is, that is profound, and you need to understand that. That God's love through Christ Jesus has been extended to the whole world. God has reconciled the whole world back unto himself through the cross and through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19 declares so why do people still go to hell? Because they reject the atonement. They reject Jesus and the cross. They reject the way to be saved, the truth about sin and how to be made righteous, and the way to God, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Then the only way we can receive eternal life is through Jesus Christ, through faith. So it's belief that gets us a, tic a ticket to heaven, and it's unbelief that seals our fate to a devil's hell. That's why I'm to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Everyone that believeth and is baptized will be saved. Everyone that believeth not will be damned. What is it that damns people to outer darkness? Unbelief. Pride. Pride. This is why so many are, are called and so few are chosen. God is calling the whole world, but only a few get chosen, not because God's picking and choosing, but because a few repent, a few humble themselves and call upon the name of the Lord, the only name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Only, only a few choose to believe in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and now confess him as Lord with their mouth. This is why you don't see a lot of rich people get saved. Jesus loves rich people. Jesus died on the cross for rich people and poor people. But why do poor people seem to respond to the gospel and get saved and so few rich people get saved? Why is it so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Pride. It's pride. They don't see their need for God. They don't see their sin. They don't see their need for God's grace and God's mercy. And so their pride seals their doom of demise and destruction. And why do the poor seem to respond to the gospel? They see their need for God. They're able to humble themselves. Why do the famous and so few of the famous get saved? And why are the unknowns, the deplorables, as some political parties and powers say, the Walmart people, <laughs> Amen. which by the way, I go to Walmart, so we need to be careful there on both ends. But why do the poor, again, and the, the unknown, the unpopular, get, get saved, and the famous and popular at large, so few get saved? The answer is pride. They simply don't see their need. They can't admit and submit their weakness to God, their need for God, and the poor... And the unpopular, we simply see our need for God. Why are there so many ministers today that are from hick towns, <laughs> from a very small hick town? And for years, I pastored mainly ranchers and farmers uh, and, and, and blue-collar workers. Uh, why does God seem to use uh, those that are in the world's standard rednecks and hicks. <laughs> Why is that? Why aren't the people with the high IQs and the, the high intelligence? Why don't you see more of them come to Jesus and more of them being used? God loves them. Jesus died for them. And God can use them, by the way, mightily. And, and, and many in this hour are coming that are geniuses and that are... Uh, have a super high IQ, but why are so few at, at large and overall? Because of pride, because of pride. Those who, who know their limitations, those who are willing to admit and submit the lack of knowledge, God gives more grace to, more ability to be all he's called us to be, and more ability to do what he's called us to do. That's how powerful humility is in our lives. And that we must learn to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Let's look real quick here at First Peter. He, he said the same type thing and how more grace comes to us. 
And he actually reveals and uncovers again some of these attributes of, of humility. Uh, I may deal with that in my next broadcast. Or what are these attributes of humility? And how do you know if you're humble? And how do you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God? Listen to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Man, that is powerful, saints. Brothers and sisters, we need to meditate in that, that we need to learn that an attribute of humility, and one of the ways you can know if you're being humble, is are you submissive to spiritual authorities? Do you understand authority at large and how to be under authority and how to have authority? When we submit to our elders, when we submit one to another in the fear or reverence and respect of the Lord, then we are humbling ourselves, and God gives us more grace. Notice again the second part of that verse says, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. When we humble ourselves, we position ourselves, and we get on this pathway of God's amazing grace, and that pathway is humility. On that path of humility, more grace comes and more grace comes. But when we get off of the path of humility and we get on this six-lane highway in our culture of pride, then God resists us. Well, we need to think about this. This is the New Testament, and James said it, and now a second witness, Peter, is saying that when we as believers have any pride in our heart or demonstrate pride in our lives, God resists us. Let me just, let me just cut to the chase here. If God is resisting you, then Satan will be sifting you, and you're going to be hurting for certain. I don't need God resisting me. I need more grace. I need to submit to God, draw near to God. He draws near to me in more grace. And now I can resist the devil and the devil will flee. Again, God is the one that resists us in proud, in pride, excuse me. And God is the one that gives us more grace, his power in our human weakness his ability to be all he's called us to be and his ability to do all he's called us to do. We get more of that when we humble ourselves. Verse 6, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. What is the mighty hand of God? It's his grace. It's his grace and his mercy. And that mighty hand is extended more to us in humility and withdrawn in pride. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Verse 8 are some symptoms, attributes of humility here. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now look, same thing that that James said, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood that are in the world. And then he brings up grace again, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Man, that's powerful. We have to humble ourselves. So, we have to know then what is pride, what is humility? What do I submit to in humility? What do I resist that is a part of pride? I'll get into that in my next session and we'll look at pride versus humility. But I pray this has been a blessing for you. We'd love to hear from you. I can be contacted at pastordwayne.com, pastordwayne, D-U-A-N-E.com. That's our website. You can go there. We have these broadcasts archived for you that you can watch and download at your own convenience. We also have our, our store that has our books and other things in it available to you. Also, we have all of our messages in, in audio and, and DVD or video files 
that you can access absolutely free. I want to thank all of my partners for helping us give away absolute millions and millions of messages at no cost, but making that available for free. They make that possible. Thank you to our partners that are a part of our television ministry and that are supporting this broadcast. Man, we need to double our partnership. The ministry has doubled recently. Our staff has increased. We simply need more partners. So please pray about becoming a partner, helping us with a donation of any size, any kind. And it really helps us with our budget to know who our monthly partners are. You can get a hold of us and become a partner, or you can contact our, our, our prayer uh, uh, line at area code 580-4040-DSM. That's area code 580-4040-DSM. 376. 4040-376. We'd love to hear from you. We appreciate your response. If you can help us, that would be awesome. But if you can't, we'd love to serve you. We have so much material available to help you in your spiritual growth. We'd like to see you access that. So get a hold of us at our website or give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching the broadcast. God bless you. want to take a moment to say thank you to our impact partners for your generosity. It's because of your financial partnership that we're able to continue giving away Duane's teachings completely free. You enable us to reach millions of people and share the grace and truth of Jesus around the world. If you're not already an impact partner, we ask that you prayerfully consider becoming one today. To do this, visit our website to access all of our free teachings that we know will be a blessing to you. You can also become a partner by calling the number on the screen. Again, we're so incredibly grateful for our impact partners. It's because of you that we're able to fulfill our mission to help people grow in Christ. Thanks so much for watching. All of our content is available for free because of the generous donations from partners of Dwayne Sheriff Ministries. Visit our website, pastordwayne.com, to find the full message series and to learn how you can help partner with us. We hope you enjoyed this message.